Welcome to the PI World interview recorded on the 21st of July 2021 and I'm your host Tamsin Freeman and today I'm delighted to be joined by Paul Jordan, CEO and co-founder of Amati Global Investors. Paul, many thanks for joining us. Hi Tamsin, great pleasure to be with you again. So we had Freedom Day on Monday and uh, then the markets wobbled a bit. Um, I think that was COVID-19 worries and maybe US-China tensions. How are you playing the pandemic and how have you played it over the last three months? Where do you think we're headed and what has that meant for your portfolio or your funds, I should say? Yeah, it's become, I mean, speaking top down, and we're not really top down investors, but obviously we think a lot top down. It's a very complicated picture. Uh, your freedom, it's rather ironic that on Freedom Day, we're probably more worried about the spread of coronavirus now than we were six weeks ago. And um, not just in the UK, but actually, uh, this is you know, now not looking good in many countries globally. Uh, the, the Delta variant is super infectious. It's certainly not finished. It's spread. It's, or it's very likely to spread much further in the UK and, and in Europe and in America. Um, but yeah, so there's. It, it's a complicated. It's, it's, it's a complicated thing to try and untangle. What would one, what should one do as an investor? But on you know layering on top of that, there's quite a few other things. If it was just coronavirus, we had to worry about. Actually, life would feel pretty simple in comparison, but there's many, there's many spillover effects and secondary effects, uh, you know, quite apart from the US-China trade tensions, um, increased tensions with Russia, uh, problems over hacking, software security, all those things that are going on in the background, which you know, in many ways are more immovable than coronavirus, and, and they're also here to stay um, and unlikely to get a lot better in the short term able to provoke crises very quickly. Um, so, you know, there's that to think about. There's, there's the global shipping um, disaster that's unfolding. And um, I, I don't know if all your listeners will have picked up on that, but there was an interesting article put out by Reuters, I think two days ago, talking about how there's 100,000 seafarers stuck on boats around the world where they really need to come off them. Uh, but they're not allowed to because when they, the ships dock, uh, the transportation ships dock, the host countries don't let them off the boats, and only 2.5% of them are vaccinated, which is an unbelievable situation. And it strikes me as just sheer insanity that no governments will step in and sort this out. There's also 100,000 seafarers who are waiting to get onto boats and can't get onto them. And uh, we, you know, we completely rely on global shipping to keep our lives going. And as one of the um, seafarers in this article was quoted as saying, you know, don't people realize how their supermarket shelves get stocked? So, you know, there's, there's obviously kind of the potential for that to cause a crisis. But in, you know, over and above that, shipping costs have skyrocketed. There's big inventory problems in many businesses. Um, so it's very difficult to draw any straight lines right now and say, well, you know, if you buy in this kind of area or this sort of sector, you're going to be fine. Actually, a, a lot of very detailed thinking has to go on. And, that, and I think... Most investors are going to be in for one or two unpleasant surprises, you know, because there'll be problems that we don't spot. I think that's almost inevitable. So how's this impacting your funds? Are you selling anything or buying anything to, to cover for these sort of threats? We took the view a few months back that inflation was likely to pick up pretty speedily, and that's, that's happening. You know, opinion remains hugely divided about inflation. Um, some people are now arguing that because the pandemic is going to switch on again, that's going to be very deflationary, maybe for a short period of time. But I, I, I suspect the longer run, that's unlikely to hold a lot of water because it, when the pandemic um, uh, spread picks up, then governments will respond again and the government responses themselves are pretty inflationary. So there's that whole kind of area of debate. We, we took the view that we should increase our exposure to uh, the, the sort of in general, the more general industrial kind of end of the market, global industrials. So a few more, a bit more cyclical exposure in the UK, particularly that focused on house prices, uh, where you know th th there's clearly a phenomenon where we, because we've all spent so much time in our houses, we're getting a lot more um, ambitious about the kind of home we'd like to live in and what we want in there, and spending a lot more time thinking about household kind of stuff. So house prices, which 
some banks were forecasting to fall by up to 14% last year have done the exact opposite. And, and you know, so we've, we've certainly picked up our exposure to that. We always had some, but we've we decided to increase it. Um, we, we tried making an investment in an airline last year, and, and we've given up on that because I, I think it's just going to be too... It's proving too difficult for the airline industry to really get going again. And I, I'm, I'm quite worried about how the airlines are going to deal with what's coming. They, 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 if there's another year of disruption, which could happen, um, that's, that's going to really cause a lot of stress. You know, it's already... You know, the weaker players have already had to refinance substantially and they're kind of in, in last chance saloon. The stronger players can't carry on forever like this. And, um, you know, that, that, so we're just choosing to sort of stand back from travel and, and leisure really at the, at the moment um, because I, I think it's reasonable to expect a, a fair amount of ongoing disruption. Um, whereas, you know, some of the retail um, companies in the portfolio we're, we're pretty happy with, they're, 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 some of them are focused like Dunelm, is very much focused on household uh, household goods. You know, that's been very strong, but it's, it's a very strong business before the pandemic. You know, the pandemic won't make businesses a lot better than they were before, but the good bus- the, those that were good businesses before the pandemic uh, will remain so afterwards and, and they can bounce back pretty quickly and you know, continue to make progress. And you know, we're noticing that quite a lot of companies in their results now are not really comparing this year to last year, but they're comparing to 2019 and they're saying, look, we're well ahead of 2019. And that's the sign of a very strong company when you can say that. Um, do you think that the pandemic has made biotech and meditech more front of mind and a better investment, if you like? I, I think it created opportunities last year, which were, you know, some of which were stellar. Um, some of those will be transitory and some of them are very heavily dependent on testing. And of course, the, the testing environment, the regimes are being extended. Um, interestingly, the, the testing companies who were very successful last year and haven't been, they've been struggling this year. And it turned out, you know, I, for reasons I'm not completely clear as to why, but the, the UK government, the, the, I'm talking about UK businesses here, but the, um, the home office has turned out to be a really terrible payer. And a lot of them have, tr- have had trouble getting paid for what they've supplied. Um, and that's going to require a lot of further investigation. I have no idea why that's going on. I mean, clearly Novasight have got into dispute with the government. That's been very tricky. So it's not been easy to chart a way through those um, stocks which were stellar because of the pandemic last year. For, health tech more, for healthcare more generally, I, I think there is increased investor appetite. But I, I think that was happening anyway. And, and that's for me, that's reflecting a bigger phenomenon than just, I mean, the pandemic's pretty big, but there's, there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's a, a slower moving phenomenon going on behind that, which is really to do with the kind of industrial revolution in medical technology, which we may have touched on last time, you know, where, where it's, it's um, things like cell therapy, gene therapy, um, technologies which we've been waiting for 20 years to become commercial are now commercializing and that, that's throwing up lots of interesting opportunities not just in drug development and most of the companies we invest in are too small to be very effective drug developers but throwing up opportunities in in diagnostics companion uh, companion diagnostics so some of the new drugs are very specific for certain types of patients um, and and the, you know that's a great opportunity for diagnostics which has never really been there before um, but also some of the adjunct uh, technologies for gene editing and so on. So, we, we, yeah, and I think that carries on. You know, that that's um, those companies bringing really good new medical technologies to market. It's never easy, but the the market is much richer with them now than it was a few years ago. And and you know, I, I think those um, those companies they, they remain good opportunities. And in the sector, biotech and meditech, which companies are you most excited about? Well, you know, the ones we have significant positions in, in, in our VCT, the Venture Capital Trust, we have a large holding in a company called Polarium, which we're very excited about. It's a good example, Polarium, of actually of a, of a technology that's been in development for 20 years. It was first really developed by GE, and then through various kind of uh, circuitous routes, ended up in a smallish company that floated on AIM, 
Um, but it's it's it has been very long in the making. But it's it's a fabulous step forwards for lung imaging, which is a an area of technology that ha really hasn't had any innovation for fifty years. If if, you, if given that the the standard of care at the moment for lung imaging is scintigraphy using radioactive xenon, um, you know that, that that was being done generations ago, and Polarion using polarized non radioactive xenon giving 3D images, uh, able to analyze the problems in a lung um, in, in quite precise detail and to characterize those problems, um, you know, that's, that's a new world for lung imaging. So we're, we're pretty excited about that. It's, it's, it's obviously, it's done well as a stock. Um, I, 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 you know, it should be able to do a lot more because it's, it's, got, uh, uh, it's bringing something to market that's very valuable and, and it's globally applicable. And you did an interview with the CEO, which I thought was absolutely excellent. Um, it just seemed quite highly valued to me, that was all. I mean, with, when you're valuing a company like that, it's, it's not easy because you don't really have any metrics to go on. And you're right, you know, the, the market can wax and wane in, in its desire to own stocks like that. I mean, luckily, we are getting to the point now when we should see an FDA approval in the autumn and once that happens, you know, then the company can commercialize and we can start to have sort of proper metrics. And, you know, sometimes that's a dangerous time to own a stock uh, when, we, because when it really has to do things, which, um, you know, I, I think it's a good thing that Polarion has been able to sell its devices to research institutions already. So at least they're familiar with the idea of selling stuff. And, and it's, not a, it's not a complete change from a research organization to a commercial one. Um, but it, nonetheless, it's still a big transition that companies have to make when they do that, and, and many of them fall down at that point. So we're obviously kind of keeping quite a close eye on what they do. I think correctly, the company raised a good chunk of money to anticipate the approval of the of the the device. I mean, very often, sometimes what you see with companies is they put everything into getting the approval, and then when they get the approval, they suddenly think, okay, what do we do now? And that's way too late to be thinking that. Uh, you, you then waste a year, really, for, for just sort of getting some momentum up and running. And, and that time is really precious and expensive. And then, you know, then the market can start to kind of lose confidence. It's, it's really going to be commercialisable. So, you know, the, the, the key moments are coming for Polarium in, in the next six months. And then we'll see, we'll see about the valuation, whether it's expensive or cheap. And any others in the sector that you're particularly excited about? Well, there's one in a similar position, which is Renalytics, which we're pretty excited about. Where, again, they've got an approval coming up for a, for their um, uh, for their kidney disease test uh, diagnostic, and um, uh, the, you know they've done a huge amount of work on commercialisation, which is why we're really interested in it as a business, and and, and think it should be very successful. Um, so that you know they've not they've not had to wait for the FDA approval as the the thing which is the sole trigger for a commercialisation. They managed to get a clear lab approval for the diagnostic test in the state, so it can already be used. And they've done a lot of work on reimbursement, which is another big, uh, very complex area that's often forgotten by investors. That when you get your approval and you get to market, if you can't get reimbursement, nobody's, you know, your number of users is going to be very low because they can't get paid to use it. Um, and that whole area is fraught with difficulty, but it's, it's something that Renalytics have uh, been absolutely expert at um, making taking the right steps in advance, so they will have reimbursement when they, uh, as as these various commercialisation steps go through. And again, it's another one that seems quite expensive. It's had an amazing ascent, and it, it it seems expensive. But but you think there's still mileage there? We do, yeah, um, and it could be wrong, of course, you know. And and again, it's you know the one thing I'd say about it is it's maybe a, when you actually go through that commercialization barrier it can be a dangerous time to own a business so I, I, I you know I don't want to shy away from that um, that point um, but I suppose our confidence in them comes from having a high level of confidence in the management team who are very experienced and are very backable and clearly if they do commercialize it successfully it'll be worth a lot more than this if there are problems on the way then you know there could be some hiccups so um, well, yeah, it's it's uh, it's an interesting dialogue, and, and clearly we you know we ask ourselves that question a lot. And talking about valuations, do you see the UK still as cheap, 
or is it just that the US is so expensive and and how does that sort of stack up in terms of corporate activity you had a bid for sumo this week congratulations and um it, there must be others in in the funds that you feel might be ripe for bid activity how do you feel about valuations and corporate activity valuations i i, I think Every investor has to sort of say to themselves, you know, valuations are expensive across the board. Whatever you buy, you, whether it's a property or um, anything investable, a painting, um, you know, uh, an antique, well, maybe not antiques, that's been a bit of a distressed market, but um, certainly shares by historic levels, valuations are at their high end. You know, in the US, they're somewhat stratospheric in a way that they're not in the UK. Um, but you know they're, they're, they're at those levels for pretty good reasons, and, and you know, one of those reasons is very, very low interest rates. So I think the, in, in terms of valuation, I don't feel concerned about the valuations per se, but I, I am concerned about you know, the, the potential for derating if interest rates go up, and that's why that, that debate about inflation is very important, um, and there is no consensus about it. And, and, and you know, the one thing I think we can be reasonably sure is whatever we think is going to happen to inflation and interest rates, we're probably wrong. So let's not get overconfident about that as a prediction. But if interest rates go up, then valuations will derate downwards. I, you know, I think that connection is pretty strong. Um, and things will get cheaper again. But you know, whatever it is you own, well, th th they'll, be the same, they'll be the same phenomenon. So it's very difficult to unpick, you know, well, if I want to, if I'm really ultra worried about inflation, how, how do I invest? Well, it's actually pretty difficult because you also know that cash isn't going to be very good for you either because that's going to get, you know, more expensive to hold as we've got very, we've got pretty high negative rates. And that the, the extent to which real interest rates are negative goes up if inflation goes up. Um, yeah, and, and I think, you know, we can simplify a lot of this by just saying, well, you know, our job as investors is to, try and be invested in the best businesses that we can find. And, you know, and yes, we might have to take some ups and downs, and there will be some downs if interest rates go up. But in the long run, that's still going to be the best approach. And so, you know, that's, that's kind of what we stick to um, from, from, you know, from the um, main, main picture point of view. And, you know, we may take some views around the edges of that. Um, but I, I think uh, as a way of negotiating the next 10 years, that's still going to be the best way of doing it. And corporate activity, do you feel that anything in any of the funds is particularly ripe for corporate activity? Um, I mean, we, we never try to buy stocks because we think they're going to be taken over. That's really not, just not our game. And some people are very good at that. Um, you know, it's, it's not really what we're trying to do. So it's not sort of front and centre of our, 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 we're not running screens to look at which are the most viable companies. Um, <clears throat> I suppose one reason for that is, if you do that from a private equity point of view, if you try and spot the next private equity purchases, you're having to go to areas that the stock market doesn't like because you know, private equity is very good at buying business that the stock market has kind of binned and forgotten about and it's become unpopular. And, they, and you know, private equity will be good at buying the ones that are in that position for bad reasons. But if you end up buying one that's in that position for a good reason, then you're, not, you know, you're in a duff stock and it's going to go nowhere for a long period of time. So... It can be a dangerous game to try and play, I and mean, clearly some people are very good at that. Um, you know, Sumo was not a typical acquisition target by any means. It was already a very highly rated stock. Um, but there is this phenomenon where some of the big Chinese companies are now, um, this was written about in an FT article a few weeks back, um, are very keen to um, get exposure to businesses outside of China. And, you know, they're willing to, pay very high prices to do that. And I think that's a, you know, it's a somewhat atypical and exceptional circumstance. That's not your average private equity buyer coming in to buy a cheap stock. It's, you know, it's an industrial player who's got specific reasons to buy something that's already expensive. And you know, they can get some synergies from it. It fits into their portfolio of businesses. Very difficult thing to predict. But Tencent, who bid for Sumo, uh, they already bought a lot of companies last year, but this year they've just gone completely to a new level. Um, and you know so that, so that is clearly a, 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 a factor in the M and A market, which is unusual, and, and it's, it's therefore difficult to predict where they'll go next. 
you know, they've got stakes in lots of businesses. Were you expecting it? I wasn't, no. No, and it's not why we held Sumo. And if you had to pick a stock from your funds that might be taken over, could you take a bet on which one it would be? Uh, well, when we had that kind of conversation between ourselves, um, I mean, I, you know, one of my colleagues, um, the name that most springs to his mind is Granger, which is a property company. And we've seen a few takeovers in the real estate sector. Granger, which, as you know, is a major owner of houses of residential property in the UK, um, built to rent and um, a sort of legacy um, portfolio of, of, um, of, of houses that uh, that could be bid for and it's you know it's trading at or below i think still a little bit below its nav um house prices are moving strongly uh it's very difficult to get a big portfolio of residential property like that there's a lot of institutional money that wants to come in to build to rent which is what granger have been cultivating for the last few years so that's a possibility but you know we're, we're absolutely guessing and it's not why we own granger but, you know, we, we, sometimes there'll be, you buy a stock for a reason because you like it, and then somebody who's in the habit of buying whole companies buys it for the same reason. I mean, that's, that can easily happen. It can be a bit annoying, actually, if, if, particularly if the bids aren't very good. Um, so not all M&A is great for public investors. Sometimes, you know, things get sold way too cheaply. Yes, absolutely. And coming back to inflation, can you uh, explain to me a little bit about the bond market complacency around inflation fears. One's always taught to look to the bond market for what might happen with inflation. And the bond market isn't really pricing in inflation at the moment. What are your views on that? Well, of course, you know, the bond market people think equity investors are idiots, so we're not really worth listening to. (laughs) And and they are normally right. So So I say with a lot of trepidation, you know, it's, it seems in the wrong the wrong place for an equity investor to be to be criticising the bond market's view. So far be it from me to do that. Um, I, I think um, you know those who are uh, who are of the view that inflation is going to be persistently higher than expected, um, uh, of whom um, um, one of my um, acquaintances, Tim Congdon, um, is probably you know a prime example who. who um, and, and actually, your your, um, uh, your 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 viewers will be able to go onto his website, and he makes his he does a very very good inflation update once every month or every other month on on a, a website of the Institute Invest of uh, of um, Monetary International Institute of Monetary Research, and um, you know, he's one of the main proponents of why inflation is expected to be higher than central bankers think it's going to be. And he, his argument is essentially that money supply, when money supply grows at the kind of rate it's been growing at, that necessarily leads to uh, higher prices. And it's that, um, uh, you know, that's the old monetarist position. Um, and it's, you know, it's using a kind of simple formula. But, but the, that, that, that monetarist theory um, where you, you, um, you, you take the money, money, money supply you multiply it by the velocity of circulation equals your number of transactions times prices. You know, that old formula, uh, when you speak to many sort of more modern economists, uh, they view it as being discredited. And, um, you know, there, there are big debates about it. And, 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 you know, one of Tim's points is that central bankers, by and large, uh, have essentially dropped that as a theory. And, and certainly in Europe, um, very much in the US, where in the US they don't even track broad money figures anymore. If you want to see what M3 is in the US, you've got to go to a specialist research outfit to get the numbers. So I mean, <clears throat> some of the economists around who uh, I've met who argue there is no correlation between money supply and, um, and nominal growth in an economy, um, that they, they may well be using the wrong numbers. And, and you know, there's no correlation between narrow money and... Um, and nominal growth, but the, you know what we're talking about is broad money, and um, you, so, you know the, the, the institutional um, concept of monetarism has been very much weakened. So you know I think um, Tim makes the point quite powerfully in examining some of the speeches of the central bankers in Europe and America in particular, slightly less so in the UK, where there's a lot more 
presence still of um, awareness and, and belief in monetarism um, in, in the US, it's kind of dismissed and therefore they're looking at other things and, and, and coming to a conclusion which they want to come to, which is that it's fine to carry on as we are. And, and you know, they may be right, but we're, we're coming to a point when, you know, it's, it's really crunch time. If, if we don't see higher inflation when the, with the money supply having grown as much as it's done, then that theory blows up. But actually, all the evidence so far this year <clears throat> is that uh, inflation is absolutely coming through as one would expect it to, based on that monetarist equation. And, um, you know, people, well, central bankers might say they're not surprised by it, but actually they are being surprised by it. And if you look at there's there's a one of the big banks produces a inflation surprise index, and it's right at the top of it where it's ever been. So you know the the extent of surprise at these numbers is big, whatever people are saying. Um, yeah, I mean the, 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 it's just the consensus among economists is that um, this is transitory. You know, they were never really worried about this happening a year ago. They're saying it wasn't going to happen. Now when it has happened, they're saying, well, it's just transitory. It's base effects. It's because things sank and now they're just rebounding. Um, we'll see. You know, I, I, I think um, if the money supply starts contracting, yeah, then inflation will come down pretty quickly. But as long as we're in a position where we've got incredibly easy money and QE going on to the degree that it's been going on, then it's going to carry on. And the reason why it's very, I think it's going to be very difficult to tone down is because We've got to a point where our politicians in the US, in Europe, and in developed markets generally have, are kind of now addicted to monetary easing. You know, they're not doing it for the. Back in 2010, it was done to solve a very specific problem of monetary contraction. If you didn't supply, if you didn't fix the monetary supply, then there was no way the economy would bounce back and it would have done huge damage. So QE actually performed a very elegant function back in 2010 to 16. You know, now it's become um, a political drug and it's going to be very difficult to get off it. And that, that's really why I'm much more concerned about long-term inflation than maybe other investors are, because I just don't see how you solve this problem where even electors now it's just expect, well, why isn't the government just going to spend money to fix every problem? And it's very difficult for them to come up with an answer because they can't say, well, we can't print it because we know we can print it. You know, the, the thing which will fix it will be um, some kind of crisis that it provokes. And that's always a thing that changes minds. And is Tim modelling a particular inflation rate for the next year, the next three years, the next where we'll be in five years? Uh, I don't think as far ahead as that. I mean, he did say quite boldly last November, I don't remember all the numbers he's come up with, but I remember him saying last November that if US inflation didn't reach 5% by April, then he'd be very, very surprised and he'd be questioning his theories. And of course, it did reach 5% by April. Um, you know, and I think he's thinking it's going to go higher from here rather than fall away. And it, a lot depends on the extent of the monetary stimulus um, that's going to carry on. Um, so, yeah, which is why yeah, actually this becomes a political question. Uh, you know, are we going to have the willpower politically to uh, to to go to a, into a kind of more um, uh, constrained? Uh, monetary environment and, and I'm, I'm not sure we are. Absolutely. So is inflation one of the main reasons that you launched the Strategic Metals Fund or, or is that more to do with the changing to a sustainable future which requires precious metals? Um, it's a bit of both of those things but it's not only those things. I mean primarily the reason we launched that fund is um, because uh, we, we had the opportunity to launch a fund with two brilliant fund managers who rate very highly. That was the main reason. Um, but I came across them because I was looking for a fund to invest in that I couldn't find. And so I thought, well, you know, if we had the opportunity to make that fund, then we should do that. And, and, and that is a fund that's run by um, people who absolutely understand mining. And, you know, mining is... It's a very particular thing unto itself. It's not really like any other industry. Um, it's highly technical. Uh, it's full of pitfalls, to, if, you know, to use an appropriate expression. Um, and um, uh, yeah, to come across two people who've been investing in mining for 25 years was a pretty rare opportunity. And when I first became a fund manager back at 
First State Investments, well, originally Stuart Ivory, but then they got taken over by First State. First State used to have a global mining fund, which was run by you know, similar people, very experienced geologists, um, had a real technical understanding of mining. And, um, you know, I, I had it in, that's always been the kind of model of a mining fund for me. Um, and then to be able to combine that with a, one that's focused on mid caps and at a time when there's a big threat of inflation, um, there are clearly um, major new demands coming on for, for various types of metals and commodities. Um, you know, there's no, it's no, there's no simplistic picture. I can't get sort of sim- simplistically bullish about every metal right now. That's, that'd be way wrong because, you know, when we launched this fund already, things like copper have got sky high. So that, that creates quite a problem. You know, do you buy copper? Do you wait? They've decided to wait on copper for the moment. Um, and actually the stocks have been deflating a bit since we launched the fund. Um, gold, which was much more out of favour when we launched, has, is a big component of it. You know, there's... I think there are good reasons for um, having some investment in gold and precious metals. Um, it's not my favourite area of the market, but it's, um, you know, when, when you've got high levels of uncertainty, potential for big political crises, uh, the possibility of higher inflation, you know, the, 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 the people who are bearish on gold say, well, yeah, but higher inflation leads to higher rates and higher rates leads to lower gold prices. Maybe, you know, there's always a risk with everything. Um, but we might have a period of time when there's higher inflation while late rates are very difficult to raise. Um, that's potentially very good for gold. So, um, uh, But meanwhile, you've got the other base metals, nickel, uh, other battery metals, um, things like lithium, graphite. Um, yeah, there's, there's just many, many interesting areas to go into in, in global mid-cap mining. Um, but, you know, doing it with a... With a proper understanding of geology and um, geological potential and, and the intricacies of mining and mining techniques. You know, that to me made a lot of sense. And it's an area that, as you say yourself, is normally quite high risk. So would you say it's more high risk with the potential for higher return than the funds that you've been managing so far? Uh, I think it's, it's a different kind of risk profile. Um, yeah, the. the Mining is it's obviously very cyclical, so you've, you can't get away from cyclical risk in mining. And, and in, in a way that if you can find a growth company, and certainly with the industrial revolutions we've been going through, if you've got a sort of a young company in the right place, it should be a lot less cyclical than that. Um, but uh, you know, once a mine's in production and um, you know, able to kind of get control of its destiny to, to a degree and starting to deleverage, the risk profile can become a lot lower. Clearly, mining the explorers are very high risk, and um, and there always will be. And that's really where you need a lot of conviction and geological insight. If you get them right, they're very high return. If you get them wrong, they're very um, bad. You know, they're very bad investments. Um, so I, but you know, the the fund the the, the fund we're, we're running is you know primarily mid cap producers. It has some some exposure to explorers. Um, and um, I think its risk profile, what's important about it, is just very different to other funds, and that's, that's kind of why it's attractive in a way. It's, it's uh, hopefully a complementary kind of risk profile. And it's only been running for a short time, but how's it performed since its, um, since its launch? Well, it's, it's very early and went down a bit, then it went up about 10%, and it's come back down kind of to where it was, it's maybe... About one percent down at the moment. From you know, it's been that kind of a market, um, and you know the, the the market in the last few months generally is it has been quite soggy in many areas. Um, so you know that's fine. It's allowed them to to kind of build a portfolio of companies that they're wanting. Um, yeah, it's it's um, it's a relatively high conviction fund, so it's it's a relatively short list, which will make it a bit more volatile. Um, so it will you know. It'll, it'll move up and down a, a fair amount, probably more day-to-day than our small cap fund would. How many positions? I think it's about 30, just between 30, 35. Very good. Um, yeah. Looking more broadly across the funds, which is the 
the company that you're most excited about at the moment, other than those you've already mentioned? Oh gosh, that's a really difficult question. Um, I mean, there's, I, I, I hesitate to say the one I'm, okay, fund managers never get right what's going to do best in their portfolio. That's one thing I've learned. So, um, and when you ask a fund manager what's they're most excited about, they're going to come up with something pretty risky because you get excited about the riskier stocks. You know, the ones which might be your highest returning ones tend to be quite dull and boring and just carry on doing what they're doing really well. Um, so with that caveat uh, that I'm going to talk about something interesting but also maybe risky, um, we, we recently uh, invested, actually we invested in a company pre-IPO in the VST, which was very is, is an unusual thing for us to do. It's the first time we've done it in many years. Um, we're developing a strategy in a way for the VST of investing in certain companies um, before they float, not very long before they float, but before they float. And the one we invested in was a company called Sayeta. And prob- I mean, it's maybe worth mentioning because I don't think any one of your viewers will have heard of it. I never have. Um, and it's, so it's brand new to market. It's floated like a couple of weeks ago. It's a company which has been, over the last sort of three, four years, has developed what we think is probably the best um, new design of electric motor for the transportation market. And it's just an incredibly promising design. And in the design, it's got, there's a very high focus in the design of making it low cost. Um, so, you know, good designs of electric motors are not just about being more efficient, although this one is more efficient and has a higher torque density than, uh, than I think any other electric motor. Uh, but it's also designed with a, a view to making it possible to produce it cheaply and, and more cheaply than other sort of high efficiency electric motors. And their initial target market is the uh, motorbike market, which is, if you think about the numbers of motors, electric motors, vehicle motors that get used in the world, by far and away the um, a majority of them are used in motorbikes, uh, for motors, if you think about motors generally in the world, because millions, tens of millions of motorbikes are sold every year in Asia. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it's the most common form of transport there, there's a lot of pressure in Asia to um, take, take um, um, petrol-powered motorbikes and convert them to electric. Naturally, it would know, be very uh, pollution-saving. It's not just about carbon emissions. It's also about um, other kinds of pollution fumes. Um, but you know, these are just um, uh, you know, it's the mass transit application in Asia in particular. And... Um, you know, they built a motor which is, you know, I think, um, the, the best and possibly the only really viable motor that's currently around for that market. Of course, it takes, it's going to take quite a number of years to go through the process of designing in, of lowering the, you know, scaling up manufacturing to get that low cost. Uh, there's always a kind of chicken and egg with new designs which can be low cost. To make them low cost, you need very big volumes. To get big volumes, you've got to be low cost. So... For, but luckily for Zayeta, there's a kind of stepping stone market, which is is the motorboat market in Europe, where you can sell motors, electric motors, much more, much at much higher prices in Europe for that market. It's also quite a good volume market, um, but that can be a sort of transitional market for Zayeta, or, or a stepping stone market, I should call it, where they, they can move there pretty much straight away. Um, because they can currently produce motors in a way that for that market that they can make good profit on. And um, yeah, I think that's ramp up phase one. Um, Ramp up phase two would be this much bigger um, electric motorbike market in Asia. And when you think about the progress of EVs, you know, even though the, the UK government wants everyone in the UK to be fully EV by 2030, almost nobody thinks that's feasible. Um, and because you know there are massive problems over gr- the grid, there's massive problems over enough energy generation, um, charging points hasn't really been thought about, and <clears throat> you can't solve everything all at once. Um, whereas the and, and also the, the quantity of batteries you need is also vast. Whereas the motorbike market actually is much easier to turn electric and will go electric much quicker, I think, than the motor car market will do. It's not to say the motor car market won't also go electric. It's just there are more barriers to that happening. And uh, there's the potential for, with, with electric motorbikes if you have batteries which you simply change over. You go into a garage, you deposit your old one like a gas canister that's exhausted, you pick up a new one, slot it in, and off you go. 
Um, and you know, so that that opens a, a door to much speedier, uh, to a much speedier sort of rollout. So, what are they forecasting time-wise for phase one and phase two? For example, when are they going to be break even? Well, I, you know, the real real answer to that is I think it's too early to say, but um, and I, I I think it's a company at a stage where yeah, there'll be forecasts in the market, but. Um, I, I think it's in such a kind of formative stage that really whatever one might put out there, I wouldn't um, I wouldn't set too much store by it. Um, you know, I, but I would say that the, the forecasts that are in the market are reasonably modest, and you know, I, I think um, I can't remember the, the sales number for this year um, is you know it's in the order of um, a few million pounds. You know, and what's so, the market um, cap? Market cap at the moment is about 100 million, and they raised. They raised 35 million at float and <clears throat> needed that kind of sum because they've got to build production. Um, you know, there's no, there's actually no shortage of demand for the motor. <clears throat> the problem is actually about being able to supply it in big enough numbers and getting it engineered in the right way, making sure they get it in with the right customers. Um, you know, that they're, they're um, when you talk to the company, you know, they're, they're, they're getting inquiries about, well, could you supply it with 20,000 motors a month? Well, no, they can't, anything like that at the moment. Um, so we have raised money to start scaling up. And scale up number one is in the UK. Longer run, if they want to serve that Asian motorbike market, they have to do ultra scale production in Asia at much lower cost. Um, and that's, you know, that's probably four or five years away, I'd say. But the motorboat market and the, you know, the sort of um, transitional, the, the intermediate markets can be satisfied from the UK and you know there's many decisions to make about whether to get third party manufacturers involved to what degree how much of the design to give away whether it, whether you let somebody make everything whether you keep some of the com- key components there's a few trade secrets protecting the motor um, they don't necessarily want to give away all of the manufacturing um, because then they'd be more exposed on that front so there's a, those kind of dilemmas you know it's, it's early stage but I think it's it's very exciting in the sense that it's addressing a big problem. There's not that many companies in the world that have focused on electric motor design. We've heard a lot about batteries. We've heard a lot about um, uh, charging points, um, renewable energy. But you know, there's been relatively little innovation in, in electric motors themselves. There, you know, there are other companies around, don't get me wrong, but um, they, compared to some of these other areas, far fewer. Now, you've taken part in quite a lot of IPOs, and yet some people or some investors very much shy away from them. Why do you like IPOs? What do you like about them? Uh, And maybe using this as an example or others as an example? I I mean, from from one of the answers to that, the most obvious answer to that is, well, we we run a venture capital trust, which probably half of what we invest in for that is IPOs, and the other half is secondary transactions and now sometimes pre-IPOs. And so because of that, we, we're quite accustomed to the kind of processes you need to go through for IPOs. And you know what's good about IPOs is you can, they're, very, they're good moments of liquidity in the right market conditions. You can get significant exposure to some very exciting companies through IPOs, which if you wait, you know, much harder to buy in the aftermarket. Um, on the downside, you know, IPOs are much less tested. They're always more unknown quantities, uh, they take a lot of work. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of research has to go into an IPO. Uh, you know, m- many companies we're investing in, we've known for 20 years, um, you know, but IPOs you've only probably known for a few months, um, sometimes less. Um, it's another reason why we like getting involved in pre-IPOs is because it gives us that much more knowledge about a company by the time it gets to IPO. Um, so there are pros and cons with them. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think for the VCT, they're bread and butter. We absolutely have to do them. And it has to be a kind of core skill set of ours to do them. But we're doing them at the end of the market where very few other people are looking, frankly. When, when, when our VCT backs an IPO, there won't be that many investors in it because it's going to be pretty small and early. And, you know, we're, we're, we're very much taking a view. We're trying to get companies which, in a couple of years' time, will really appeal to a much bigger group of investors. That's part of our thinking with it, really. Um, you know, we're looking for companies which can be the next mainstream aim companies, but they won't be at the time we invest in them. They'll be much earlier 
with the small companies fund, it's a bit different. We're then looking at IPOs, which are much more mature. And there we're looking for ways of getting significant stakes in businesses where we think there's you know, some long-term growth to come. So what have you taken part in recently that's perhaps profit-making in the Smaller Companies Fund? Oh, well, I think the most recent one we took part in was Victoria Plumbing. Victoria ah, Plumbing. yes, yes. Yeah. And is that one you're particularly bullish about or are there other IPOs that are actually profit-making that stand out for you? Uh, well, I mean, that, that one, you know, we, we like founder-owned, founder-managed businesses. I mean, that, that's... Uh, so Victorian Plumbing ticked a lot of boxes on that front. Um, and clearly, there you've got an entrepreneur who has got incredible knowledge of a market, has got an amazing track record of success. You know, I suppose what, what is unusual about Victorian Plumbing, which we've seen occasionally in the past, is it's before it floated, it, it had already gone through a hockey stick. You know, normally, when you see an IPO, it's been terrible and flatlining for years, and then the hockey stick's all about to happen. And, you know, you have to take a view on is that likely? And m- most of the time, it's not very likely. Um, but when a company's already been through that kind of a curve, it's really proven itself. There's a, a company that I can remember years back, which was very similar, was Keywords. You know, before that floated, it had three years of incredible growth. So you weren't, this wasn't coming from nowhere. And, you know, Victorian plumbing is hopefully a bit the same. Um, and we've, we've had a very good experience with Gear for Music, and, um, you know, the, the, that and Victorian plumbing share some characteristics of, you know, really understanding e-tailing, as it's called, uh, you know, all the kind of nuances of how to be a successful online retailer. And it's not a given. You can be brilliant on the high street and terrible online. Um, it's, a, it's a different skill set. And you don't worry that sometimes IPOs are dressed for the IPO and then it goes backwards from there. Yeah, that's true. I mean, you know, it's it's a it's definitely a tendency for companies to be dressed up for IPO. Um, even more so where you've got a private equity seller. You know, they're very smart. If you've got a very smart seller, that's what they do, and they make very good money out of it. Um, and uh, you know, they're smart buyers on the market, and they're smart. So they sell back at crazy prices, having ripped all the assets out and leased them. And you know, it's. We don't really much like buying from private equity sellers onto the market. I'm pretty wary of that. Much prefer a, a sort of founder-owned company, founder-managed business, uh, where you're not sort of cashing out previous investors, where there's that risk that's just dressed up for an IPO. Um, and, you know, the IPOs in the UK, it's pretty patchy, and, and particularly where you get the big banks involved. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of amazed about the investors' tolerance of buying IPOs from big banks only to see them go down 20%, 30% and keep on doing it. And it's kind of amazing. There was there was one that floated that we didn't see or didn't pay any, didn't have time to pay attention to when it floated, um, which was um, we, when we when we looked at it, uh, when we looked at it afterwards, um, we started to think, well, actually, this is, uh, this, is this, this is quite interesting. Um, and it's, it's called Alpha Wave. Um, and, and that one um, wasn't really shown to mid-cap investors in the UK. It was done by big banks. And I don't know who they went to, but it went down kind of 25, 30% after its IPO. And we started sort of studying it a bit and thought, well, actually, this is a really interesting business. Uh, it's, uh, it's got a very high growth rate. Um, but unlike a lot of the high growth companies like Dark Trace or Deliveroo, it's making a lot of money at the same time. What does it do? Uh, it, um, it's um, IP for um, uh, silicon wafer design. So it's very technical. And it's into a very specific area of IP design, which is about the way that um, uh, components of a computer talk to themselves. So the way that one chip talks to another. Um, when, when chips communicate internally, they use parallel processes. But when they communicate externally, they use serial processes. So you have to be able to convert parallel communications to serial. And um, it's called CERDES serialization, deserialization. And that's so and you need the chips have to have architecture for that process. And clearly, you know, there's lots of very good architecture for chips, but um, chips have now become so tiny, um, and every time they get smaller, this particular problem gets more acute. And so there are generational changes in serialization, deserialization 
deserialization design. And there's a certain number of people in the world who've cracked this, who are the kind of leaders. Um, and they set up companies, they sell them to people like Intel, as happened with AlphaWave. And then a few years later, those people leave and set up another business. There's a new generation of technology. Probably it'll get sold to another company again. But that's really the story of AlphaWave. Um, and it's got some of the kind of world leading ex um, expertise in this particular area of IP design. Um, and for the new chip technology, these ultra miniaturized chips where they're going, I think the current generation is moving from seven nanometer chips down to five nanometers. Um, you know, these are kind of almost atomic size chips. The, the, the design problem just get, has had to be, has had to move on a generation. And Alpha Wave are kind of leading, have got a sort of leading edge technology in that next generation of design. So we thought that was pretty interesting. We, we ended up buying some of it, but not in the IPO. We bought it actually, I don't know, 25% lower um, because it was a slightly messed up IPO. I still don't know quite what happened in it, but um, it was placed rather bizarrely, not necessarily with the right people. To be honest, I can't fully explain it, why, why that happened, but it gave us an opportunity. It sounds fascinating. I'll have to take a look at it. Well, thank you very much indeed. I, I mustn't take up any more of your time, but do tell people where they can find you and find out more about the Amati Funds. Yeah, well, we've just redesigned our website. So amatiglobal.com is our website and it's got a wealth of information on it. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. And to our listeners, thank you very much for joining us. And you can find over 100 investor interviews like this at piworld.co.uk forward slash PI Wisdom as a video or as a podcast. And please subscribe to receive a notification of a new video as they're published and you'll get no spam. And keep us motivated to continue to produce these interviews by liking or retweeting or commenting on the content. It means a lot to us. Many thanks for listening and stay well.